I know you mentioned earlier that some people believe that this was a botched abortion. Yes. And they point to an odd piece of evidence. A coat hanger was found by police uh, just sitting right. on the top of her car. And, and I mean, all I can say is that to me anyways, a coat hanger, what, you know, could be indicative of, the, of that, but, but it's a, a fair stretch from a coat hanger to a, to a, to an abortion. It, it seems unlikely. I mean, to me, just based on Joan's personality, both Joan and Martin were fairly conservative people. I think um, it didn't seem to, and and both uh, were somewhat. Certainly, Martin was was pretty religious, and um, the the likelihood that Joan would have wanted to have an abortion and not tell Martin or any of her. Uh, relatives or friends seems to me to be fairly, fairly remote. Also, trying to schedule an abortion in the middle of the day with her son upstairs ready to get up from his nap and his daughter across the street with a neighbor who might walk her, you know, back into the house. Uh, and, you know, especially something taking place in the kitchen, not necessarily that it had to, but that's where most of the blood was. It just seems to me to be a stretch to go from uh, that, it's it's not impossible. Not, I mean, not, nothing in this this case is impossible, but it just seems to me of, of low likelihood. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Martin, you, you pretty much put to rest the idea that he might have had something to do with this uh, in your book, as, as you've stated. He had an alibi, which of course doesn't stop a husband from from killing a wife. We've all heard stories of, of one spouse putting out a hit on another spouse. But there wasn't an obvious motive in this case for Martin to do something to Joan. There was no life insurance policy to collect. They got along really great. Right. As far as I could tell, I mean, if, if, the, if the description of them as a happy couple seems to be correct. There's no evidence of any, you know, abuse or, you know, any, any of the things that uh, reports to the police or anything like that. The, the relatives all thought that they got along well. They questioned their insurance person. And I think the only life policy was on Martin, not on um, uh, Joan. And they, they, there were efforts made, I think, to check to see whether it was possible that Martin could have, you know, had a romantic interest outside the, the house. And they came to naught. They never found any evidence of him uh, involved in an, in an affair. So, you know, the likelihood of him being involved seemed to be fairly remote. Their, their personalities, the, the likelihood that he would have hired a killer to kill his, his, his wife just seems out of character for their, for their personalities. And um, the police, I think, you know, I mean, there, there were other things, too. The, 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 the police decided that they had pretty much cleared him because they looked pretty hard at him at first, as, you, as the police always do in, in these type of cases. But, uh, you know, he basically took care of his children uh, until Lillian got married. He kept David at his home for, for quite a long time. He stayed in Lincoln, and when he sold the, his home to the um, National Park, he basically bought another house in Lincoln that looked a lot like the first house and was not all that far away from it. He never changed his phone number, so always with the thought that it was possible that you know, he might get a call from, from Joan. He never remarried. He never, uh, you know, as far as I know, I mean, there was no indication of girlfriends, although, you know, possibly they, there could be, but there was no real bad press about him, about anything like that. And, uh, you know, he, he worked, he continued working at his employer for another 10 or 12 years, became, uh, he went out on his own, became a consultant, and did that for another 20 years or so. So he, you know, it's it's not impossible, but it just doesn't seem to to me to add up to anything that um, would really point in his direction. 
Right. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, too, about the car. We haven't really talked about the car yet. There were sightings, right, by neighbors, the milkman, I, I believe as well, of a mysterious car parked on occasion in the Rish driveway. Yes, there were. Um, the, the, the first time that this car was seen, the uh, teens uh, lived on the same side of the uh, Old Bedford Road as Joan and Martin did and on the same, the same side of the street in one house up. And basically, the school bus that dropped Virginia Keene, her, her, I think, 12 or 13-year-old uh, daughter, would drop her off at the, the intersection of 2A and Old Bedford Road. She then would walk up uh, Old Bedford Road, heading north, past the Rich House, and then to her, her own house. As she was walking past the Rish house, she noticed a car in the in the driveway. Now, further up the driveway was was Barbara uh, was um, Jones' old 1951 Chevrolet. But right at the end of the driveway, there was another car that was variously described as blue or gray, but seemed to be. They finally kind of settled on about a 1954 to 1956 Chrysler. And that car was nose into the driveway. It was not known by anybody to have anything to do with the, the, the Rish family. Rish, uh, Martin Rish did not know anything about the, the car. And that car then, about 15 minutes after... Uh, Virginia saw the car in the park in the driveway. Another neighbor from uh, fur- much further up up the street, Hilda Ziegler, was driving her car south on Old Bedford Road towards Route Two A, and that car at again at three forty uh, p.m. was pulling out of the Rish driveway, and then drove north. So rather than going down to 2A, which was the main highway, drove north towards Hanscom Field. Now, uh, Hilda Ziegler didn't notice who was, who was in the car, didn't pay all that much attention to it, and then continued you know, on her way. So you basically have the car in the driveway at 325, the car leaving the driveway at about 340, and it's unclear why the car was there at that point. At if you recall, at about three forty-five, Lillian would have been returning to her home uh, when Barbara Barker went out to the, the grocery store, and so uh, there was no car there, and there was no one around in the house at that point, and uh, so that was just a short time later. Now. The police were very interested in the car. There's always been a fair amount of, of um, speculation as to what was involved with the, with the car. But I was able to find a December, I think, 10th article from the Boston Globe that basically indicated that that car had eventually been found by the police. And unfortunately, it had been checked out forensically and they couldn't find any evidence that helped their forensic case. But the, the speculation has been, and I think to, in my way, it's, my view is fairly correct, is that that was the car that Joan probably left in. And the, the police had a hard time tracking it down. I think it was in the, the Rish driveway on October 24th, it was found sometime in early December. It was found to have been a stolen car. The car had been re- was then returned to an owner who was living in Medford, Massachusetts, which is, I don't know exactly how many miles, but further east of, of Lincoln and closer to Boston. There's not much information on the owner. There's unfortunately not much information as to when that car was stolen. 
which to me would give a, a better indication of whether or not there may have been some premeditation involved in the crime, because if the car had been stolen much earlier, if, if, if the car had been stolen actually fairly close to the time that Joan disappeared, you know, it would tend to indicate maybe that there had been a plan to get a, uh, a car that couldn't easily be identified with a particular suspect and then use that car in connection with Joan's kidnapping. Um, the milkman who had come on October 24th to deliver milk saw nothing that day that was out of the ordinary, but he was actually the foreman for the company who was covering the regular milkman was a man by the name of Socket or Socket, not sure which, who um, was on vacation when this happened. And so uh, Socket said that he remembered that about a week before the 24th, maybe, I think it was the, uh, the 19th, I think it was actually more like five days or so, it was a Thursday, that he had seen the same car backed into the Rish driveway. Now, I tried to look through the records to see how much confirmation of his characterization that it was the same car. I mean, there were, there were ways of, for them to, to verify that what he saw was the same car. They could have shown him, for example, the car that they, they found. But I was never able to fully uh, confirm that he had, in fact, seen the car before. But assuming that he had, then that would indicate that there was some premeditation and somebody involved in some form of planning um, of, of um, the events leading to, to, to Joan's disappearance. Now, there could be other explanations for it, too, but certainly it, it raises some, some suspicions. There, there then were some additional people who had been driving on Old Bedford Road who had seen the car. And in fact, at some point, someone called one of the newspapers in Boston to report that, that the person, the caller, who was a him, had seen that car and for whatever reason had remembered a partial plate. And I think it was P94. It was a Massachusetts plate, P94. And the person that was the source of that was never, as far as I can tell, identified. But the police used that identification of the partial plate plus the description of the car to then hunt for cars. And I think they went through at least a thousand cars to try to find the one they, they found. And then unfortunately, once they found it, it didn't turn out to be the uh, gold mine of information that they hoped, hoped it was. But it certainly seems likely from the timing, since Joan's car was still in the driveway and the, the car had been behind, uh, the, the, this mystery car we're talking about had been behind Joan's car and it didn't leave till about 340. And then at 345, no one could find Joan, would tend to indicate that, you know, it's, it's quite possible that Joan was taken out of the house in that car. That would also match the fact that the dog's scent ended essentially at the, the driveway. It also uh, is consistent with the fact that no blood was found past Joan's car. Right, yeah. The fact that the car had been in her driveway on multiple occasions su suggests, I guess, that it didn't belong to a complete stranger. It was probably someone she was familiar with. And the idea of, of uh, premeditation, if this crime was, was in fact premeditated, it was not planned out by someone very smart. I, I mean... The middle of the afternoon, uh, neighbors out, kids running around playing, right? An abduction would draw less attention in the middle of the night. That, that's that's my, my view. I mean, when I first started working on this, I thought that it was more likely that some either stranger or kind of familiar acquaintance was the culprit. And then as I got into it, 
I felt a little bit more, particularly when I started reading some letters that the, the family had, had written, that there might be another avenue to explore. And with, with respect to a, a, an abduction, I mean, you know, by, by some sort of a stranger or, or, or acquaintance, the, the likelihood that you would do something in the afternoon, as you said, park your car at the bottom of the street of the driveway, then determine that you're not going to attack the person in the house and leave them in whatever condition you're going to leave them in the house, but that you're going to bring them out and put them into a car where you could be seen because, again, all of the houses around had people there. That seems to me to be a pretty gutsy or amateur uh, plan of of what you're going to do. It makes it seem a little less likely that this is a situation where where Joan may have been attacked attacked by you know some kind of psychopath or something like that. It doesn't seem to me like a very good plan. Of course, you know you can say that well nobody knew that. Uh, Martin was going to be out of the, the house that night, but of course he traveled a lot. So if someone had been there before, maybe they were observing the house and realized that he would be gone from time to time. So um, to me, anyways, the the idea that it was some sort of uh, kind of random attack or a sexual attack seemed less likely given all of those circumstances. And I began to change my mind. And, you know, as the, as the police investigated, I, I don't think that they ever gave up that possibility. And, and I don't think you can give up that as a possibility. I mean, they, they did, you know, pretty extensive search. I mean, they, they, they went through about a hundred people who had been seen on or about the the old Bedford Road uh, from the time the Rishes moved into the to the, the time of the event. They they went through you know people peeping toms, burglars, all sorts of people like that. They canvassed the entire neighborhood. You know, talked to all her classmates and doctors, dentists, taxi companies, you know, hospitals, all all sorts of things. They they interviewed eight hundred sex offenders. They they uh, took the prints from at least. 2,000 uh, military personnel from, from Hanscom Field, and they followed up on hundreds of tips. So it wasn't that they ever gave up on the idea that it could have been an attack by, you know, some random person that wasn't necessarily uh, close to Joan, but they really came up empty after doing quite a bit of work. And as I say, they, they looked at it somewhere in the vicinity of 10,000 finger, sets of fingerprints by the time they were thrown. And they never were able to identify. You would have thought that perhaps, you know, if, if somebody had been a serial rapist or killer, or if someone, this was the first time they had, had done something, that they would have been more likely to have then committed a crime similar to this at some point uh, in the future and either would have been identified through their, their fingerprints or at least the, the the modus operandi would have been the same, and that would have and the and the police were looking for people who committed crimes that had a similar MO to this, and they kept finding that at least in the Massachusetts area, that this idea that you would take somebody out of the house to assault them uh, was pretty rare. It didn't usually happen. Usually, the the attack took place. In the, in the house. And I, I don't think that there was a case until about 1968 in a nearby town of Newton where a woman was taken out of her, her home. And that was at, at night so that they had a similar situation, but they, but it was an entirely different set of circumstances. It didn't seem to bear on the Rich case at all. So, the, you know, that that's another reason that you're not seeing a, essentially somebody following that same M.O., uh, in, in, in subsequent cases. Back again after these brief messages. And we have returned once more. 
So I would be remiss if I didn't ask you more about this. So definitely one of the more sensational, mysterious aspects of this case. And this is one of the pieces of evidence that people who believe she might have been suffering from amnesia or dissociation point to. These sightings of her or, or someone who looked like her walking along various roads later that afternoon. Would you talk more about that? Sure. Uh, it is. It, it, you know, it, as if the ambiguity of the evidence at the house is not sufficient, they compound it with the fact that there were three sightings of someone who looked like Joan during the period of time that whatever happened to Joan may, may have happened. The first one seems to be, if, if, if these sightings were of Joan, the first one seems to be the most likely, I think. Basically, Joan was last seen by Barbara Barter at 2.15. About a half an hour later, there, a woman is uh, driving from Concord into Lincoln. Her name is Georgia Wright. This is 2.45. And she's going home because she needs to, her children will soon be coming home from school. So she's driving in the right lane going east. And on, in, the, in the left lane, there is a woman walking with a gray coat, which is similar to the coat that Joan was out of Joan's closet, who's wearing a scarf uh, or a headpiece, that uh, headscarf, that uh, Joan normally didn't wear, but is kind of wandering aimlessly, not looking like she's in very good condition. And she's walking down the side of Route 2A. And that's a highway that, that handled maybe uh, 5,000 cars or something like that a, a day back in, in those days. And the person that's walking is, is walking on the, on the street because there's no sidewalk. She's going apparently over. There's a little bit of a stream there. She has already, if she has given the direction she's walking, which is west towards Concord, she has already passed by the houses on Old Bedford Road near Joan Rich's home. She's also passed by Woods that she could have gone off into, but she's still wandering down the middle of the road. Now, the, the woman, G Georgia Wright, uh, looks at her and goes past her, doesn't look at her face, but somehow identifies her as probably around uh, Georgia Wright's age. How she does that, I'm not quite sure. But some of the, her description is, is consistent with, with Joan, so this is at about a half an hour after Joan is last seen. It's probably only 100 or 200 yards away from the Rish house on the, on the main road into which uh, Old Bedford Road empties. And so it's hard to say that that's not Joan. Uh, and yet you also have the situation that there's a car, that the mystery car is in the driveway at the Rish house and doesn't back out till about three three forty. So is it possible that Joan got away and was then picked up by by the car? Why is it that she didn't just go across the street to the Barkers? Why didn't she go into the woods? I mean, again, you can you know dissociation, amnesia, all of those things can be used, and certainly she wasn't a apparently in good uh, health as she, as she was walking. But in any event, Georgia Wright goes past her. Nobody stops to help and nobody calls, you know, the police to, to check on the, on the woman. And that's the last that anybody has seen on, on Route 2A. They, they talk to other drivers, bus drivers, school bus drivers, and the like, and nobody else remembers seeing anybody on, on 2A. Then about uh, 15 minutes later, Another woman, again with a gray coat, again with a scarf, this time I think a different color scarf, and with a description that's a little bit physically different from the description on 2A, is seen in, in the median strip of Route 128. 
Now, Route 128, and this was at the intersection of, of Route 128 and Winter Street. This is maybe about six miles away from where Joan was seen at 245 on Route 2A. And she's in the median strip of the highway, kind of wandering again, disheveled, not looking like she's in the best shape. And the person who sees her, a woman by the name of Eleanor Leary, who's driving northbound on 128, says that it looks like she has blood coming down her legs. Now, if, if you try to connect the, the sighting at two, on Route 2A with the sighting down at 128, you basically have to have Joan walking along at 2A and either hitchhiking or getting picked up by somebody who then drives not west, westbound, but in fact turns and starts heading southeast for about six miles or so. And then somehow Joan gets out of the car or is released from the car, not on the side of the main highway, but on the median strip. And this is a highway that basically handled tens of thousands of cars. It was probably one of the biggest highways in eastern Massachusetts. It, 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 it basically was the circumferential highway that was kind of the hub that connected uh, the, in, the, the inner Boston suburbs with, with places outside of, uh, of 128. It was just at the eastern border of Lincoln. Um, so it was fairly far away. And it was not a road that you could walk across the street with any anticipation that you'd get to the other side alive. And she's in the median strip. So that's confusing. There is no indication that somehow she's been kicked out or that there's been any violence, um, you know, that anybody's seen a car stop and have her get out. There's nobody reports anything like that. So she is now walking up this time. So when she was walking on Route 2A, she was walking west. When she's walking on 128, she's heading north in the median strip on this very busy highway. And again, Eleanor Leary has, when she told this story, had already seen Joan's picture before. So that, to me, always somewhat clouds the picture of an identification because it's fairly easy sometimes to be influenced but unconsciously by a picture that you've seen and read that into your memory of the, of the person you saw. She's also going by in a car in the passenger side at about, you know, somewhere probably between 40 and 60 miles an hour and looking out probably on the driver's side and through the back window and, you know, is able to see blood on her legs and, and still provide a description and identify her as Joan. So it's not something that's impossible, but it's, it's, it's a good trick if you can do it. And, um, then, and, and at this point, at 3.15, we know that the car is still in the car in the park, in the driveway, the Rich driveway, is there at 3.25. So 10 minutes later, that car is in the Rich driveway and is seen by Virginia Key. And so Joan is, is walking at that point, and this is between 3.15 and 3.30 on that Tuesday afternoon, about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, depending on how you count it, around 4.25 p.m., there's a similar identification of a woman or, or observation of a woman, this time walking southbound, not in the median of 128, but along the western boundary of the southbound lane of 128. So this essentially means that the, the, the person has walked a mile or more up through the median and has somehow been able to cross 128, which is not a trick I would try to do. And in her described condition, not one that I think would hold out any prospects of success. And she's now walking in a different direction. This person sees Joan. Again, the description is similar, but not quite identical. She's also wearing a headscarf and Martin 
Rish would later testify that Joan rarely wore anything on her head, but there were there were a few times when she did. And uh, in this case, he says there's not blood running down her leg, but it looks like mud. That person also goes by. So basically, you have a woman who looks like she's in distress walking along one of the busier highways in Massachusetts, probably around you know commuting, commuting time, and nobody stops, nobody calls the cops, and the woman disappears into history. There's no indication of what happened to her, whether it's, you know, it's Joan or not. We know that the car in the driveway, of the, the Rish's driveway, had left around 340. So that means that Joan would have been then walking around at 425 on, on 128 again. So I've tended, and I think Mark Safarik agreed with me, uh, the, the FBI profiler, that it seems like those identifications on 128 probably are not Joan, even though in one case she's identified as Joan, and in all cases she's described as having, you know, at least similar coat and similar shoes to Joan. And, and it, you know, her age is in her 30s, which Joan was. By that time, Joan was about 30, 31. So it's not clear. Uh, you know, for sure, whether that was Joan or not. There's all sorts of speculations as to what might have happened to to the woman. There was construction going on on Route 128. The Lincoln police chief, Algio, suggested that maybe she had fallen into one of the construction ditches. But that never seemed compelling to me because you would have had to fall in the ditch and then been there all night. And then when the construction crew then came, they wouldn't check out what was in the, the trench. You wouldn't have been able to crawl out of the trench and they just would have buried you. I'm hoping that, you know, they, they construction schedules can be tough, but that seems to me to be a little, uh, a little uh, negligent. So I wouldn't think that that was a very likely uh, scenario. So it's not clear whether the person on 128 is, is a red herring or not. I tend to think that it is. But she on the woman on Route 2A, I guess I would just say I'm agnostic about that. She's close enough in time and space to Joan's house and when the events could have been occurring with, with Joan. But it, in any event, it would seem that she would then must have been taken back, presumably, or you have to introduce a second malfeasor who, uh, who caused the problem. Uh, with, with Joan. So I think that, I think that, that the, the sightings, the three sightings don't get you very far in trying to figure out what happened uh, with Joan. But people, particularly people who feel that there could have been a, a mental or physical injury, tend to look at that and feel that that's evidence that, you know, that Joan was in a dissociative condition, that she had amnesia, and that she may have kind of gone off walking, and that something tragic to her happened as a result of that. Um, Again, uh, she would have had to cover an awful lot of ground, or she would have had to at one time, you know, been walking, and another time driving, and another, and then walking in all sorts of different directions and crossing major highways. So it's all quite a trick. To, to do, and there's no real clear idea of why she would still at 425 if if it was Joan and and she had been seen at two last seen at 215 why she might still be in the area if a, a kidnapping had been involved. Was there any thought of, about maybe taking Sadie the Bloodhound to those areas to see if she could pick up Joan's scent along those roads? It's, it's possible. I don't know that they did that. And that's a good point. Uh, I don't know if they did that. I don't, I know that they made massive searches along 128. They, they could have had dogs, but I never read specifically that they tried to track those trails. They did massive searches along 128, both sides of 128. They did searches of the Concord Reservoir, which is a fairly good-sized body of water that borders right next to 
128, right in this, in the area that we're talking about. And in, you know, many of the roads in the area and all through the woods in her house. In fact, the, the, the day after Joan disappeared, I think the Air Force had a helicopter in the air and um, the, the company that Martin worked for also lent their corporate helicopter to the search. And there were literally hundreds of people doing searches. So there were there was extensive searches done, but I can't specifically answer your question. Right. I mean, your mind can wander a million different ways thinking about all of the possibilities. <laughs> uh, so many theories. Gosh, if she was abducted, did she escape from the car? Right. And if so, why did her kidnappers let her go, you know, and... Did they pick her up later on or did someone else pick her up? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I don't, you probably want to avoid a drama in the, in the, in the median strip of 128, I suppose, but I don't know. It, it, it's just the, 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 the circumstances that you have to conjure up to get her through that circuit of sightings, you know, just seems to me to be kind of a combination of, of someone who, is in a, you know, kind of a fugue state or whatever the proper term for it should be, and then yet savvy. I mean, you know, you go past the, the woods near her house where she could be hiding. You, you go past the neighbor's house, but, but you still have the presence of mind to either flag down a car or go with somebody in, in a car that might take you to the hospital. Then somehow you're out of that car and in the median strip of 128. You know, it, 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 it just seems to me to be something that has somebody operating, you know, in, in one case in a kind of an unconscious level. And then in another case, someone who seems to be trying to get away and is consciously trying to, uh, you know, to escape from something. So it's not entirely clear to me that... Um, Obviously, it's not entirely clear what happened. I just tend to think that it doesn't get you too too far wondering about that stuff since there's no identification of, of her ever getting picked up by a car so that you can't start following a lead, you know, relative to a car that may have taken her off from, from 128 or from 2A. So there's not much to work with with those those sightings in a sense but i know that the police included those sightings in the second uh, bulletin that they put out about joan and spread that essentially across country so it was something that they wanted to get more information about right right so it, you know in any case like this obviously police have to look at people who might have a motive to do her in and as you've said, she was considered very kind by people who really knew her, right. uh, good-natured. Yeah, I kind of grew to like her doing the, <laughs> doing the book. <laughs> yeah. But, but as you've talked about a bit already, there was a person in her life who she was having a conflict with, this messed-up relationship with her stepfather, Frank Natris. And again, she, she had confided to multiple people including her husband, that he'd abused her in some fashion. The, the intimation was sexual abuse when she was younger. But in the disappearance of Joan Risch, Frank had an alibi. The fingerprints didn't match. Uh, but then one wonders, could he have enlisted an accomplice to go and, you know, maybe shake her up, scare her? But, but then maybe things went badly, you know, there are so many possibilities. Yeah, it's it's a it's a variation on kind of the theme of what you think with the with the husband. You know, like uh, the Thompson case that I talked about in the book. And yeah, it's oh, it's oh, a. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I do want to say that we have talked about the Carol Thompson murder case on this show before. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it happened in St. Paul, Minnesota. And there is an episode about it. I just wanted to get that out of the way real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's 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 a situation that it it's not something that I 
kind of jump to as a solution because, you know, having a stepfather involved um, with the daughter is not something that I uh, want to jump at as a, as, a, as a possibility. But there certainly had been indications that in some way he had abused Joan. Joan was very reticent, as I said, never really described what, what it was that he had done. But among other things, told her mother that if you knew what had happened, you'd either divorce him or have him committed to a mental institution. And Joan basically held off telling pretty much anybody for a long period of time and then talked to her brother, uh, Peter, but again was somewhat cryptic about what, what happened and then told her husband, Martin, but again, didn't go into, go into any detail. But uh, effectively, what it appeared to be is that sometime in the period, maybe 1942 to 1944 or something like that, there had been some form of, of abuse. The, there was some confirmation of that from an uncle, a maternal uncle who had seen the this, this stepfather kind of touching uh, Joan. But there was no, as I say, clear proof, and nobody talked about it all, all that much. And I think it may have continued to stay that way, but for the fact that in 1957 or so, Joan and uh, Peter Natras, actually it was 1959, I think, decided that they wanted the mother to separate from Frank Natras and to bring their youngest daughter, and I haven't mentioned her before, but it was Evelyn. She was born in 1945, so she was in her teens when all this was happening. And to, to have them, the mother and daughter, go to California to live in the in Los Angeles area, which is where Peter uh, Natras lived and Another one of the brothers, David Natras, lived up in San Francisco. And Frank, who had never been particularly successful at work and really had never taken care of the family too much, had essentially kind of sponged off of his sister, uh, Grace, for a long time. And then Grace had had some stroke and she had worked for a lawyer as a, as a legal secretary. And the lawyer did everything in his power to keep Frank away from any of the sisters' funds. So Frank didn't have any money at, the, at, at that point and, that we know of. And he basically stayed in New York while uh, the wife and daughter went to, lo to live in Los Angeles. And that continued for a while. And... Then uh, Frank was able to get a job, but he had gone from essentially president of his own music pu publishing company to essentially a shipping and receiving clerk at a uh, department store in the New York area. And so he didn't have a whole lot of money, but he wanted to start making efforts to try to get the daughter and the wife back to New York. And it wasn't clear entirely what the motive was. He was claiming that, well, it's all best for the family to get together. Uh, Peter Natras and Joan were concerned, one, that it could be that he just wanted them, both the wife and the daughter, to start working so that, you know, he could either stop working himself or supplement the, the income coming into the house, or that he, he might also abuse Evelyn. And uh, that was what they were concerned about. And so there began to be correspondence in the spring and summer of 1961, where Frank was trying to get uh, his wife Alice back with him and Evelyn as well, and the family making efforts to try to stop him. And um, 
there were a series of letters that were in the file to this effect. But there was one letter that wasn't in the file, and that was apparently uh, a letter that Joan had, had sent to her stepmother, Alice. And in the letter, because Alice was beginning to waffle and made it look like she might want to go back to New York with Frank, Joan came out and indicated that there was abuse, and that, that this was something that uh, that the mother had not known before, and she was shocked by it. And it's not clear at that point whether Evelyn heard anything about this or whether Frank heard about it e either. It's not even clear that Frank knew where Joan was now living. So all of this is taking place, not necessarily with, with Frank's knowledge, but it's possible that the, that uh, Alice could have been speaking to Frank and, and let the cat out of the bag as to what had happened. That, however, the letter convinced Alice that she needed to uh, stay in California, and that tended to make Frank angry. And at that point, the correspondence then shifts to efforts by Joan to try to work out uh, either getting the, the mother a better job in California so she could bring more money into the house or some sort of social welfare. So the mother is providing financial information to Joan, and this is as late as early October of uh, 1961. So this is just a few weeks before Joan disappears. And um, that essentially is the end of the, 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 the correspondence at that point. Joan then disappears on October 24th and is never found. The, the possibility that Frank could have been somewhat involved in, in planning some sort of an abduction, it's not entirely clear. As you said, he, he was fingerprinted and his prints didn't match anything, which but, and he also had an alibi that he had been working that day at the department store. Uh, he also took two lie detector tests, but they came back inconclusive because he was too nervous during the testing. So I, I, I spoke with the, uh, the investigators that were helping me out, and they basically said that usually you can't draw any conclusions from inconclusive lie detector tests, but that you that certainly either he should have been tested again or they should have done more investigation. But at, at that point, there, there's no more communications in the family on that issue. Joan disappears. And then at some point in the 1960s, Frank winds up coming to California and living with uh, the wife and with Evelyn. And then Evelyn, I think, winds up getting married sometime in the late 60s. And then he and Frank dies in 1970. So, you know, it, it certainly indicates, I mean, there'd be a question, for example, well, if, if Frank knew that Joan had already let the cat out of the bag, why would he then try to stop anything? Well, in a sense, she seemed to be the main roadblock to Frank and the wife and daughter getting back to to get together again. So he had some interest in doing it. He also, one of his sons, Ben, was the only son who stayed in the, in the area. So he was in the New York area and he was a bartender and his, his prints also didn't match the prints at the crime scene, but he was, um, he couldn't conclusively show that he had been working the day that Joan was, was taken. He did have a car, however, that was in bad shape. But, you know, you also have enter the, you know, the stolen car that uh, that's used for, for the crime. So, you know, at, 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 at that point, there's a possibility that maybe Ben was involved. Is it possible that Ben went to the house maybe with a Confederate? I know that when the police interviewed Ben one time, they basically thought that the person that he was rooming with was, quote, a ne'er-do-well. I'm not sure exactly, you know, if that indicates a criminal 
or not, but but it could be somebody that he's met and as a bartender, maybe he has connections with, with people who'd be willing to get involved in something like that. On the other hand, it might not be Ben at all, and it may be you know two other people that were recruited for the duty. Um, the the arguments against it, for example, is where would Frank get the money to um, pay for somebody if he was doing something? And you know it would be a heck of a big favor for somebody to do something for you know to pay you back for something you had done in the past. And also, it's not entirely clear that he knew jo- where Joan's house was, and it's not entirely clear that um, you know he would have been able to identify people that would would have done it. I know that uh, the police felt that Ben seemed to be actually pretty upset about Jones being missing. So that's another indication that maybe Ben wasn't in, in, in involved in it. So it's it's partially the, the fact that the, you have this history. You have the history, as you mentioned, of Joan having told a lot of friends of hers that she was afraid of the stepfather, that she was afraid that if anything happened to her, that it might be the this, this stepfather. You have Aunt Florence, who basically came right out and said that when she first heard about it, she thought either Frank did it or Ben did it, or they had somebody else do it, do it for them. Martin Risch felt that he wouldn't put it past Frank to have done something. The rest of the family was more ambiguous about it. There was a history in the family of not talking about problems, not letting things air out, of always hiding issues. So that could have contributed to that, perhaps. So you have that, you have the the fact that this particular controversy is going on as late as, I think, October 10th, uh, two weeks before Joan disappears. And so that tended to sway me. And, and basically, I wasn't trying to solve the case because I don't think you can. There's too many facts that are undetermined in, in the case to pin the blame on, on anybody. But basically, my feeling was that if I were a cold case detective hired to, to look into the case, I would probably start with the family conflict and see if I could exhaust that. Uh, there were a lot of things I couldn't find out. I couldn't f- check whether Frank or Ben had criminal records, for example. There was, you know, I couldn't find any evidence of them having had prior run-ins with the law or anything like that. And so, that, you know, there might be things that you could do as an investigator. Then they, you know, if you couldn't, if that didn't pan out, then the second fallback position would be maybe the uh, uh, the stranger or the uh, uh, known um, acquaintance. But those, are the, you know, and then ultimately, I guess, you know, the third fallback would be the uh, some sort of an accident or something like that. I, I kind of rule out the, uh, the abortion idea. I don't think that Joan, given her nature, given what everybody said about her, uh, how being so close with her family. I mean, one of the neighbors said that that girl lives for her husband and her, uh, uh, her children. It just doesn't seem to me that she's... You know, uh, somebody who's going to do a gone girl thing. Plus, talking to Mark Saf- Safarik, he said that it did, it wasn't good staging of a crime, and um, he he didn't think that it was a staged crime either. So the likelihood that she would have just taken off, I think, is also fairly remote. Yeah. So so a couple of years after her disappearance, someone went to the local library. Yes. Checked out a book and yes. made an interesting discovery, right? Yes, she did. She went to the uh, library, in, I think it was 1963, so it was about a year and a half or so later. And she picked up a book, and uh, when she looked at the uh, cards and when she had to return the book, it indicated that Joan Rich had taken the book out previously. and It was a mystery. So the, the, the woman who I think wrote for a local Lincoln newspaper wanted to see if Joan had taken any other books that might be of interest. And so the police, the uh, library staff looked into it and uh, came up with about 24 books that Joan had read in the six months she was in Lincoln. I mean, she was a voracious reader. And um, the story essentially was that most of the books 
were, were mysteries and had to do with people who had gone missing on their own. And so you had the gone girl type scenario. And um, this got the attention of the police who looked into it, but they decided that it, it didn't go anyplace. Uh, so they essentially wound up dropping it. And so I tried to look at it to see if there was any possibility that, in fact, the woman could have been correct about it. And what, what I found was that I, I think somewhere in the vicinity of eight of the 24 books were just unrelated to mysteries or their books of poetry, travel and things like that. There were another uh, group of the books, maybe you know, six or eight more that were novels by uh, John Updike and, you know, fairly popular authors at the time that she would have been interested in. She was a history major. She loved literature and she probably would have been reading, you know, those type of books anyways. And I think it came down to there was maybe seven or eight books that I would consider to be mystery books, some of which had to do with disappearances. But but my wife and I split reading duty and went through, uh, you know, several books. And basically we found that in mo- most of the cases, the, the plot was the person that disappeared was actually the person that had been killed and didn't really give a, a story about how a person had disappeared on their own. And th- th- there was no indication. There was, there, was, there was nothing in those books that would give you a roadmap for how you would, one, fake your own disappearance, stage a crime scene. And there was no help in terms of how you would get social security identification licenses or anything like that. So um, I think that, you know, given Joan's uh, personality, how close she was with her kids, that everybody talked about her being very close with the kids, being obsessively concerned about the safety of the kids. She was someone who had lost her parents uh, when she was eight years old, the likelihood that she'd want to replicate that for her own children seems to me to be fairly low. And so I don't really see anything in that scenario that's compelling to me. Well, this has been so interesting. So, of course, your your book is available wherever books are sold, bookstores, online. And thank you for spending so much time with me Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it very much. Again, I have been speaking with Stephen Ahern. His book is called A Kitchen Painted in Blood, The Unsolved Disappearance of Joan Risch. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow and happy holidays. <laughs>